Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimple the Limp, and I am here with a special treat. Really, really special treat for you. Uh, Gimpy's gal just got done guessing this, and she could not pronounce it. And I probably won't be able to pronounce it right either, but I'm um, gonna go with Agar Sanguinis. Yeah, the Agar I don't think is right. I think Sanguinis is right. So, Ager, Agar, Agar Sanguinis. I don't know. It is French. I'm not good at French, so. But. This is a awesome game I'm really looking forward uh, to playing for you guys. All right, so we're gonna do this like I do all my review throughs where I go over a basic overview of the game, components, gameplay, stuff like that. And then we do a few rounds. Actually, we're probably gonna play through this whole thing because I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, play through the rounds of the game, let you guys see how it's actually played. Now, the thing with this game is that I covered one very similar to it a few years back. And for lack of not being able to pronounce that one right either, it's die I, <laughs> die. It's got X's and I's and all those French letters in it. Uh, it's in my playlist. Definitely go check it out uh, before you guys watch this one. And the thing is, right? So I said a lot of the same things in that one that I'm going to say in this one about it being a good game but having some flaws, right? So it was like it was like that old classic car that's been beat up and left sitting out in the rust. You know there's a gem in there, but you're going to have to polish it a little bit to get it out. And they had received, you know, some of my criticism, criticism, uh, criticism for other people, and decided they were going to fix this stuff. And the designer got a hold of me and said, hey, you know, I saw your review. You know, we'd like to send you an updated copy so you could review it again and show the differences and the improvements that have been made. And uh, hell yeah, I'm all for that. Definitely uh, want to show what was going on. And one of the big things, oh, actually, we'll cover that in a second. Now, this is a different game than the first one, all right? So this isn't the exact same game, but the the gameplay is the, the same, okay? So for me, it's even better because now I've got a different one in the series, multiple ones in the series, which is all up my alley. I, I freaking love that. So the game itself is... It's a medieval, a little before medieval uh, type of tactical skirmish gameplay. So man-to-man -man combat using javelins, lances, archers, spears, swords, shields, all that good stuff. And I really love that idea. I had been looking for a game just like this a few years back. I really wanted that hex encounter gameplay with swords and shields. You know, fantasy, if they had spells, all the better. If it was historic, like these are historic, these are based on real historic battles, which is just freaking awesome. So those of you who are into the historical, really gonna jump into that. I was like, you know, either way. And I uh, came across what was known as the Cry Havoc series. I think they're calling it, yeah, this is the part of the Norman saga. But the game series was originally called Cry Havoc and it, I think it was originally created back in the 70s, but obviously the components weren't as good back then as they are now. And the thing is, is they took what was and they basically recreated it now, you know, a few years back. And they didn't update anything. They just basically re-released it again for people. But one of the problems is that the components weren't that good on the first set of games that uh, existed back in the 70s and they hadn't corrected anything. Well, now they've gone back and corrected it and basically modernized it and updated it to the stuff that people are expecting nowadays. So most of the complaints that I had about the game are gone, right? And I'm just all about that. So one of the biggest complaints that I had was obviously the counters because the counters were horribly, horribly thin. We're talking paper thin counters. Excuse me, I'm a little choked up this evening. But yeah, we're talking like paper thin counters and these are definitely not. These are normal thickness counters. They're a little bit thicker than white core. I know they look like white core, but they're not. They're like a light brown core and plenty, plenty, plenty thick, feel very nice. Uh, these I have clipped myself. So yes, they are rounded. I don't have any that uh, I haven't clipped yet to show you, but why don't you guys get a nice zoomed in look. You can see the component quality is great. And that was like probably my biggest beef with the, the first version of it was the fact that I could not pick the counters up, right? That was just driving me nuts. 
because you had to like use your fingernails or a pair of tweezers to get the counters because they were just so thin. And the thing is, is I ended up getting dye eye D. I should, I don't even know what the hell, God, I feel so bad calling it that because I know it's not how you pronounce it, but I had gotten that one and it actually had thinner counters than the original versions way back in the day. So the, my first experience was like the worst of the worst. And I'm not saying the game's bad, but it just the worst possible one that I could have picked. So now that they've updated this, I'm also excited to try it out because the counters feel great in your hand. They're just as good as any of the modern day counters that people are putting out. And I actually like their paper mats. Now these are paper maps, but they're the cardstock type paper. And it's the same material that I had talked about previously that I really like. It's this cardstock, but it's textured. And I can't show you, hold on, let's see if I can get you to hear it. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it's not slick, right? So your counters actually have a little traction on the paper. They're less likely. It's actually, yeah, you guys can see it. I'm sliding the paper around and those counters aren't moving, right? This actually gives you a little bit of traction there on the paper so your counters don't just slide around. I like these paper maps. These are fine with me, perfectly fine. Counters stick to them, uh, great. So this didn't even need to be improved at all. Now, there were a couple things that I did ding on on the game previously that just really can't be changed just because it is the nature of the beast when it comes to this game. Uh, one of it had to do with knowing which side was which, but the thing is with the forces, they can go in different directions. So you can't really just have the blue forces or the pink forces, the red forces or whoever, because things might get interchanged due to certain sides changing on who they're gonna be battling at certain times. So they had to come up with a way to handle that, which again, the same as what we'd seen before, when you're looking at the counter, that bottom right set of letters tells you everything that you need to know. The T stands for Turks, so that's your faction. For this one, we're either going to have a T, a N, or I think it's R. Yeah, T, N, and R. So the N and R forces over here, which I'll show you in a sec, are attacking the T forces. So it's Franks and Armenians versus the Turks. But that's what I'm saying. You can't really have colors on these to designate it since the uh, the forces might fight interchangeably. So the Turks, and, uh, not Turks, but the Franks might fight the Armenians, just depending on what historically happened, right? So we can't make all these guys blue can't make all these guys red. So that makes it easy. You can look right at the counter and I know any of the ones that have T on it, bam. The letter next to it, again, let me get zoomed in here. You see it's I, that's simple. It's either gonna be I or C, infantry or cavalry, right? Bam, easy peasy. The letter next to that, the last one, that's the key one you gotta pay attention to. This one's a J, which means he's javelin. You're gonna have things like J for javelin, A for archer, um, P for peasant, uh, B for bravo, you know, all that type of stuff, right? So any, the, the last letter is gonna be what type of troop they are, like this guy, N. <laughs> so 10 over here, he's a Napata, I think is how you pronounce it. Basically he has Molotovs, so that's pretty friggin' cool. He gets to throw Molotovs. So we even have that, but we also have Calvary in the game as well. We got one of the Frankish, Oh, no, this is Armenian. Let me grab one of the Frankish cavalry. So looking at the cavalry, you can tell, obviously, the counter is bigger because the dude's riding a horse, and it will take up two hexes, and it is directional. These single-man counters are not directional. Horses are. That does count for something in-game. And then you see down to the bottom right, N for Frankish, which... I don't know why someone knows historically why N goes with Frank. Uh, C for Calvary and K for Knight. So this is a Knight. He's going to get in there and chop him down with his sword. And just as easy as it was before, on the left-hand side, we have our stats. Same as for the infantry. Black is your attack. Red is your defense. Blue, bottom left, is our move. That's it. So the higher your attack, higher your defense, higher your move, the better. If the defense is circled, it means he is uh, wearing armor and gets a plus one bonus uh, when he's attacked. So really, really easy to keep track.
track of. Now, the only other thing about the game is something that really can't be changed, and I'm gonna pan over here to show that to you. These forces here are the forces that the, the Franks and the Armenians are starting with in this scenario. So all these are one faction that are on the board, and this faction is invading from this side, and they're gonna try to take over this town, okay? So from here down are the actual forces that are starting this battle. From here up are their extra counters. That's the little pain in the butt part, but there's really not much that you can do with it, and it's about as ingenious a system as you could come up with for something like this. So let's take our knight that we were just looking at as an example, and we'll throw him out. He's actually going to have four counters. And we're gonna to try to do this quick so I don't waste a whole lot of time going over it. But again, oop, I grabbed the wrong one. We'll grab Jocelyn since it's that one. Okay, so now we got the right knight. So you see here is our main knight, bam. And then here's the wounded knight, all right? So you see Jocelyn, it's the name of the character up there on the right, both NCK, but this one has higher stats, 30, 19, and 12. This one's 20, 12, and 12. So the stats have gone down because he's been wounded. So this is healthy, this is wounded. We flip him over, riderless. So the horse can be dismounted. So you can use this if the rider's been killed, if he's dismounted, whatever he's done. And then on the other side of this, dead horse. Oh, horse died, so we'll leave it there. And horses can actually be <laughs> terrain as well, so that's kind of neat. So each cavalry member, each person who can ride a horse is gonna have four total counters because they're gonna have two of them on the horse and they're gonna have two of them off the horse. So same character, Jocelyn here. Let me switch it so it's the same side. Healthy one, wounded. Right, and then when we flip over the healthy one, we've got the stunned, and then flip over the wounded, and we've got dead, all right? So, and bodies, a pile of bodies can get in your way in this game too, that's gonna be a nice simple way to take care of it. If we are riding along with our knight and we charge, and let's say someone throws a javelin at him and they knock him off his horse and stun him, you would take and flip the counter over to the riderless horse, and you would put the stunned knight there next to it to symbolize what has just happened. Really, really cool system. I like how that works. It is a little bit unwieldy at first because there are so many counters that you have to keep track of, but I have found that if you organize yourself well before you start your scenario, it's not that big of an issue. I went ahead and got all mine organized, bam, in stacks of what little type uh, fighter they are, and then separated them out up here in the same stacks. That way, whenever these guys have something happen to them, I can quickly go to one of these stacks. If it's one of the cavalry guys, I've got their counters there. All the infantry are here, good to go. Split up by ar uh, archers, peasants, knights, whatever they are. Grab whatever counter I need and switch it out on the board. Same thing for these guys. Their counters are up here. Now, the ones that are on the board are just these guys, these are actually cavalry that are getting ready to uh, come into the game. They're not gonna come into the scenario until turn five. That's actually what I got. Nice 20 sided die sitting over here to help keep track of. That didn't come with the game. It comes with a 10 sided die for combat, but I grabbed this one out because you guys can see that one a little easier uh, on camera. So before you set up your scenario, make sure you divide the forces out because yeah, it's not just a single counter. Think of it kind of like um, some of the bigger games like Thunder in the East or 1985 Under an Iron Sky. You could have more, multiple counters representing a single unit or a single division or something like that. Same type principle in this game. Okay, so I've been talking about a lot of good. A lot of good. I got to say I am wholly happy with the way that they did this. Oh, and one more other good thing that I did have to flesh out before uh, I moved on. The box is unusual from what we are used to here in the US, just the size of it. And that just comes down from the map itself, the map size that they use and the type of map. They don't want to fold it more than once to make sure it's as easily playable as possible. And 
this is the box size that accommodates that. And I actually like them. They work really well. They hold a lot. They work great with counter trays, as you guys can see. Right there, got a counter tray full of units, ready to go. So no issues there. The one issue I do have, right, is this. And that's the thing. I'm always going to be honest with you guys about stuff that I don't like. And this part is still the, it's the same material as this, as the map itself, but they need to be cut out. Again, that wasn't changed. These weren't made into counters. And the thing of it is, is I can kind of see why they did that now that I've played with it a little bit more. Because if you do cut these out, they will lay flat on the map itself. And because of the material, the map material that I was talking about earlier, the counters don't slide on, these won't slide on. So they'll stay on the, uh, the map fairly easily and you won't have a ridge of an extra like counter shape there on the board. These I'm okay with them doing as a cutout. I prefer a counter sheet, but if it saves on cost and gets more people to get the game, I can live with it. This is a, a sacrifice. If this is the, the worst of it that I can ding on, I'm, I'm okay with it. I can live with it. The only exception I would make on this is to make it uh, maybe some type of PDF file or uh, easily printable download for people who do buy the game that maybe split these up into a couple of different sheets that when someone prints it off, because I don't want to cut this up. I want to keep it as it is. So if I do cut these out, I'm probably going to use cardstock and uh, cut them out. But sometimes the shape changes, the size changes just a little bit. So if they were to create a file that made sure that when you printed it, it stayed this size somehow, I'm not sure if that can be done. Computer wizards out there, you, you guys let me know down in the comments if that is something that uh, would be easier or not something they could throw on BGG that would be good to go because the charge and the lance counters are on here as well. Those specifically, I would have liked to have seen be regular counters, okay? And I don't really know why they didn't with the exception that this is the way that it's always been done with the game. The charge and the lance counters had always been on the, uh, the extra terrain sheet in the previous games. And I still would have liked to have seen them as this because there's uh, campaign game scenario versions that have a uh, big map. And I'll show you guys that later on in a, in a final review part of the video where you can have this huge campaign and uh, castle sieges and move your forces and buy forces. It's kind of like a RTS, right? You know, you're moving around and having battles, real, real cool stuff. All right, so if you can make the counters for all that, make the, the charge and, and lance counters there instead. You know, <laughs> just don't put them on that get out thing. That drives me nuts. Uh, I went ahead and made my own again for this game. My little white core counters, which I actually gotta say, I thought I did decent uh, on these. They're not too bad. I even clipped them. So I had the files from a uh, previous uh, version, the die eye where I created these. So I really just had to print them out and uh, use a glue stick and uh, make a few of these. Wasn't a, a real troublesome thing. It only took me, I don't know, an hour, under an hour. I uh, made the same thing with the lance counters and you use these in case you have someone who throws a lance weapon to signify they can't throw it anymore because they have used it. So yeah, my biggest gripe with the game that I've got now is the fact that I would have liked to have seen those two counters made into actual counters. Like I said, I can kind of understand why they didn't, but I really think it would have been better if they did, but small gripe overall. All right, so let's talk about the scenario that we're going to uh, be playing. We'll start off and get uh, get started here real quick. I'll show you guys the uh, one player aid that you're going to need for this. There are extra player aids. I'll show you guys later on in a separate video when we get into the final review aspect of it. Uh, but this is the main one you're going to need for play. It shows you all the modifiers, combat tables, all that good stuff. Uh, missile characteristics. This is for the different types of ranged weapons. And my light is... There we go. Sorry, shadows are funny. Uh, different types of uh, weapons that you can use. Lances, javelins, daggers... Short bows, uh, composite bows, foot composite bows, mounted, crossbow, all this other cool stuff. Uh, all the different modifiers for it. 
These tables at the top are for shooting. These tables at the bottom are for attacking. And then there's infiltration. That's when you're moving uh, next to someone. You're not really trying to infiltrate or sneak in this game. You're just trying to squeeze by without getting caught. Uh, real simple to understand terrain effects chart shows a nice easy to see picture of all the different terrain, how many movement points it costs and what cover type. The cover type has to do with taking ranged fire, you know, like being shot at by an archer, the light, medium, heavy, or infinite, infinite means you can't see them. And that comes into play up here, as you can see where it says cover type. And then if they're in heavier cover, more likely to not be able to damage him. Sorry, I got distracted, little boy needed something for a sec. Okay, and this scenario has to do with the fact that the Turks are holding this town and they start off, as you can see, guys in all the different houses they have to deploy all around. I figured I'd go with roughly two to three, depending on the size of the house in each house. And then this one is like the palace, the bigger house, so I put four guys in there. Three in this one since it was a little bit bigger, and then two, 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 two. Again, they're getting reinforcement. Their cavalry are riding in to support them. They're gonna be coming in from this side, but they're not going to arrive until turn five. Our Frank and Armenian forces start off the scenario and they're coming in from this side and their goal is to take over the town. So depending on how many of these buildings they control, and by control that means no Turks in there and they have at least one person inside of it, at the end of the game, at the end of the rounds, uh, determines on whether or not they win. I wanted something that was more than just an open field with two guy, or two lines of troops going at it and smashing each other. This looked like it would be a whole lot of fun with all the different buildings. Now you will notice that the buildings are all different shades of colors. That has to do with height, all right? So like this, you can see is the lightest. So that's base or this is, just the ground, okay? So ignoring open ground, we got level zero, and then the next darkest up is level one, and then the next darkest, which is this one, two, and then three, and then, you know, so on with all the different colors. I figured for ease of play, because I'm a butcher that, they were just gonna go with what it kind of looks like. These look like outside parapets, so we got one here, one here, one here, and then the insides, of the buildings. We're just going to play it that way just for ease so I don't get confused on who's on uh, whatever different level of the game. But these guys are up on the outside, right, up here. And there are counters. So let's say one of our guys, this guy climbed down and he's inside the building, but in this section of the building, right, over here, but he's inside of it instead of outside of it we put him under one of those counters just to signify that he is inside the building rather than outside of the building. All right, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna start slow. Easy combat, try to see what's going on, just try to play it out nice and easy. Now, the thing of it is, is you can do some reactions in this game if you're a ranged character. So there's offensive fire, but there's also defensive fire. So as these guys come in, some of their archers, but they only have a couple. They got, I put them on the top to hope for the best for them. They got one here and they got one here. I put a javelin guy here just in hopes that he might be able to throw his javelin at someone, but I don't want him to use it because it's a one-off, right? So once he uses that javelin, you know, you have to throw something on him to signify that he can't throw it anymore since he's already thrown it and he's assumed to pull out a short sword or something to, to fight with. Uh, the way you can know is any person who has a lance type weapon, like javelin, spear, whatever, they can throw it as long as it doesn't have a flag on it. So this one has a flag. He can't throw it. All right. So javelin guy could throw his javelin, but you know, he'd be unarmed. The archers do have multiple rounds though, so they can shoot. So I figured one here covering this area in between these trees and then one here kind of covering the courtyard and maybe back in this direction a little bit. Uh, line of sight is fairly intuitive. So the archer's up here, right? But the building is still here. So think of it uh, as this lower floor. He's looking over the roof of this lower floor. So obviously he couldn't shoot someone who's right here, but if they're farther out, so if they're as far from the building as he is from the edge of it, 
he can shoot them. So what is he, two hexes away, so he couldn't shoot in these first couple of hexes, but if someone were standing out here, then yeah, he could shoot because he's looking over the edge of the building uh, down on them. And you can't shoot through trees. So these palm tree frond things, he can't shoot through those. That's obviously gonna block line of sight. And if someone's in those hexes, then that's gonna block him as well. So that's a good way for someone to come in down through this direction, maybe blocking him. But he has to think about when he's gonna shoot because I was trying to decide how I'm gonna annotate it. They did have counters and guy eye for it, but they don't hear. I was thinking I might just turn him sideways to signify that he's already fired uh, defensively in this round because he can't just continue to fire. He only gets one defensive shot uh, per round. So he can't shoot at everyone that's coming through. And when you're shooting defensively, if you have more than one character doing it, like you have to declare all your shots first. So let's say I had a, a knight come just, you know, charging in through here, boom, 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 and he got in a line of sight of both of these guys and they wanted to shoot down onto him. That has to be declared before it happens. So you have to say, I'm shooting with both. Because let's say one shoots and kills him, the next one still effectively took his shot. He can't say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not taking my shot now since the knight's dead. No, you got to declare that beforehand. But anyway, let's go ahead and move a few counters on the board. We're probably not going to get all these guys done because it's uh, this whole group that I've got to start with. But we'll get a few on. We'll get a few uh, quick rounds of combat or something because I'm going to have the peasants start this because the Franks, for some reason, brought peasants. And peasants are almost useless. <laughs> like, this guy is the worst counter. So I figure I'm going to put him on first. What is his name? Renaud. Renard. Yeah, Renard. Renaud. Four attack, three defense, eight move. And he's got a stick with a rope attached to it. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, no, don't kill me. <laughs> he's just, he's pathetic. <laughs> but I figured I'd start with these peasants. I got six peasants that are part of these forces. I don't think they have a whole lot of good forces, to be honest with you. Two stacks of little peasants here, six of them total. Uh, some light infantry, a few heavy infantry on each, the the Franks and the Arminians. More archers, they have four archers compared to their two, so hopefully that'll help. But let's send in the peasants first. So, and I'm not counting this little half hex as part of their movement. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have this first guy run in doo -doo -doo -doo, through here, and he's going to try to sneak in here, and we're not gonna waste this archer shot on him. And I'm not sure what this is. I think it's just a well, like a lift bucket type well thing. But we're not going to say that this blocks line of sight. I don't believe. So he's going to come in here. And again, his movement is eight. And moving through these on foot is one movement point. Two for cavalry. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what I'm going to try to do is eight. So... He's moved to here and he's trying to move to here. He's doing an infiltration. Okay, so I have to grab the little infiltration sheet. And that is on this bottom side, yep. Okay, so there are no modifiers. Attempting to infiltrate is not armored or wounded. He's not a rider, so that's not gonna matter. And the person being uh, blocking him isn't as well. Now, there is a reason I am trying to do this. This guy's defense is the same as his attack, which means it's it's like pathetic, right? So I want him to have someone else extra to help him out with it. I want to move someone in. So you do offensive shooting first as your first bit, but no one's on the board yet, no cavalry charges. So we're starting basically here at step three with movement and defensive shooting. So when we get into combat in step four, I want to have a couple of peasants up against this one guy in hopes that that will be able to cause some damage to him. Because if you have two attacking one, you get a combat shift to the right on the combat outs table. So that's why we're moving here with him. So we got a roll and we are looking for a one to five to make it. Come on, do it, boy. Eight. Of course not. Character wounded. <clears throat> Knew that was coming. This guy sucks. <laughs> and of course, his, uh, his turn is done. 
So we're going to switch out his counter here. I'll set it at the bottom of the little peasant's pile. And now he's wounded. That is, that is bad. And we're going to go ahead and turn him to the side as well, just so I remember that he is already activated. No, you suck, you little mucker butt. Oh, uh, he's going to die. He's going to die. So we're going to have to send another peasant in there. Try to stop those guys. And like I said, I'm using the peasants as like cannon fodder. And they've got a decent guy up here. That's a light infantry. And you can attack through windows as well. So if I put someone in one of these hexes, they can fight through the windows or shoot through the windows. They got rules for that. It's really just awesome stuff. So, but the thing is, he would get a terrain advantage. Terrain comes into combat, uh, into play later on. Can give you uh, shifts on the combat odds table. Up to two column shifts. So, let's just send this guy behind the other one. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. He can go seven, eight. But here's the thing. If he fails, he can't end his turn there. He can move through the friendly. But I think I would have to end there if he doesn't make it. So, yeah, we'll, we'll attempt it. We'll attempt it and see if he can do that. Can you do it? Can you infiltrate? Don't die on me, boy. Three. Yes, he did infiltrate. So maybe we can get an attack off. I can still get the combat odd shift. Now, later on when he attacks, it's going to be his five versus his four with a combat shift. Now, the way you do that is you subtract the red number from the black number. That gives us a one. And when we look at this combat odds table for against infantry, you see zero to four is that column. We would shift one to the right if it's two attacking. So we would be at five to eight. So whatever the number is, whatever that difference is, right, between the, uh, the odds is what column that you're rolling on. So you want the biggest difference that you can so you can have a better chance of killing those guys. Zero to four, it's very likely the attacker is going to die. So hopefully this will get us. Now let's turn him to the side as well, just to remember. And you can use whatever you want to remember that you've moved, guys. I have my little beads out if I decide to go with those instead of turning them to the side, just whatever. I've got one more peasant. And I think we might have to swarm. The thing is, there's only one entrance here. See, there's a little doorway there. So we, they can come in through here, go through the doorway, and there's a little hatch right there to climb onto the roof. And that's an extra movement point to go up like that. So should we go? Should we bum rush this building or send some of these guys somewhere else? This is a better peasant. That would be six to five if I send him there. Let's see, I've got a five, three, six, four, seven. I might send a couple of these guys around the back. Um, and see, this guy's better. Look at this guy. Nine, five. So he's definitely better. The archer's not great. Let's see. Oh, I'm not sure where to send them. Well, the better forces. I was thinking that the... The peasants would be like cannon fodder to soak up some of the hits going in. So I should probably just let them do that. And let's let them do that. And maybe they'll they'll do something decent. So he's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. And yeah, where's she gonna take the shot? We'll take the shot here. He's gonna do a defensive shot down here on him. So he's got six, seven, eight. He can get to the doorway if the defensive shot misses. All right, so he already declared that he's taking the shot. All right from here to there is four hexes away. And looking at it, I wish I had let him go one more hex farther because it would not have gotten a modifier because he is a composite bow. And it is, oh no, composite bow, he is at short range. I was looking at the wrong one. On that so yeah range 1 to 12 so foot composite bow he can do the defensive shooting so there's not going to be a modifier for medium range so it's just going to be the flat-out roll we're going to look at the missile against infantry and we're going to look at the type as composite bow right so we're going to roll on this medium table 
and then we're going to compare it against what type of cover he has. <clears throat> now, he's standing out in the open, so he's going to have no cover. He's going to want a high roll, I believe it is. Yeah, yeah, high rolls are better for the defender or for the person getting shot at, and low rolls are better for the attacker generally in this. So we're rolling on this one and scrolling over. So let's roll real quick, see what he's going to get. Oh, that is bad for the shooter. He got a nine. I don't even think he's on it. Yeah, no effect. Absolutely no effect. How did you miss him? Boom, right there. He's turned. And actually, to help me differentiate this, we're going to do this. That way, I remember it easier by looking at it so I'm not confusing uh, forces on who's turned in what direction. So this guy turned because he finished his act uh, activation, and this one shot. So he's shot defensively this round. Oh, he missed. But... We'll uh, bring in the rest of the forces. And like I said, that's what I wanted the the peasants to do, kind of run in in the first wave and soak some of the fire so the better troops coming in at the end would be able to not get shot at. I haven't figured out exactly what I'm going to do with the cavalry yet, though, because cavalry do best when they're running in and charging. They get a bonus to their attack, but there's no one really to, to charge. They're all tucked into the buildings and you can't really charge them in the building. So the knights are either going to have to come in and park their horses and dismount, or they're going to have to just kind of hang around in the courtyard for five turns waiting for their cavalry to show up and then charge them in this little alley right here, which could end up being very bad. Actually, I doubt that they could even do it because you got to go at least four hexes, I think, in a straight line just to accomplish a charge. And that wouldn't work. This little alleyway would be ding, 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 ding all the way across the board. So they can only charge if I get a horse over to here. And as the enemy knights come in, charge them up in this direction. And they can declare counter charge as well, which changes everything. It's really, really cool. I love this system because it's simple enough to grasp it. It's only 20 some pages of rules. I think it's like 20 or 21 pages of rules that aren't too hard to grasp. Fairly big size text even. So we're not talking about like feeling like you're in college again, reading the damn rule book. And it's it's relatively intuitive. You know, the, the line of sight isn't overly bogged down. And even just playing by yourself like this, as long as you make a, a relatively decent judgment call, you can, you know, play the game and have fun with it. And I always really just enjoyed these, the knights and the horses and ah, you know, swords and shields and clashing and stuff like that. And you really got to think about your tactics because stuff like this, can I jam in a couple of guys and pin them against the wall? It's my best chance because these peasants aren't that good. But if you get a group of them stabbing at someone, they might be able to kill them, you know, just cool stuff like that. Really, really love this. All right. But you guys stay tuned. We're going to keep playing through this, show you guys, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to play through the whole damn thing because I've really been looking forward to playing this game. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to definitely put them down below. Uh, throughout the course of this, I'm going to show you guys some of the other games that they do have in the series. And definitely at the end, I'm going to do uh, a final part showing you guys some of the campaign systems. And then there's an expansion pack as well that I won't be playing through in this video series, but I would like to do a video series showing like a castle siege scenario using that one, which would just be freaking awesome. So anyway, you guys put your comments down below and I will catch you guys in the next one. Y'all take care.